Um, I would like to welcome Dr. Vincent Rogers. So I'm, I'm a physicist and I study gravitation and sometimes people say, well, what is there to know? What goes up comes down, right? And then uh, that's the end of the story. It turns out that gravitation is very interesting as far as uh, it's probably one of the most complicated and one of the most familiar forces at the same time. So let's talk about what gravitation is, what else can we know, and what has come about. How do we, how, let's, tell, let's tell you a story, my story of gravitation. So there are four known forces in the universe. <coughs> Electricity and magnetism are, are, are considered one force by physicists. But at the time of people like Gauss and Riemann in the, in the 17, 1700s and 1800s, these were two separate things. And for a long time, people thought that electricity was one thing and magnetism was another. But the physicists since Maxwell have now known that these are actually the same thing and that it's just a matter of motion or relativity which brings these two together. There's something called the weak nuclear force, and if you've ever wondered how come the Earth can be so old, it was actually one of the reasons why, why Darwin's theory was verified, because he said that the Earth had to be very old for his theory of evolution to work. But uh, people thought because lava was hot in the Earth, how can the Earth be old if it's, uh, if it's got a two point, if it's sitting in a, in a background empty vacuum, and if, it, if lava was going to still be hot, it would have cooled off a long time ago. Turns out lava's hot because of what is called alpha and beta decay in nuclear physics. And it's the same kind of physics that you use when you build a smoke detector. You have americium, and if you look at your, if you look, if you take apart a smoke detector, you'll find that it's actually a, a nuclear particle uh, detector. And actually, does when the smoke gets in the way of things, it actually interferes with the detector, and that's how you notice smoke. So that's what the weak nuclear force does. <coughs> the strong nuclear force is the thing which gives us, it gives you protons and things like that, which uh, can actually stick together to form more complicated stuff like uh, helium. So I got a little demo here, and I'm going to ask Leslie's mom to do it for me. So in this demo, you'll have to stand up. <laughs> okay. In this demo, I'm going to just, just hold this and uh, try to keep, uh, I'll keep my finger here so it doesn't fall apart. Okay. Just, just put a little pressure here and just step back. So this guy in the, right here behind us, make sure he can see because we're going to be professors <laughs> for a moment. Just put some pressure on this and see that it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't want to go down. Just put your finger through the crack and, and put, push press down, up and down. And, and at some point it sticks, right? Mm -hmm. So at some point it's a repulsion force, right? But then when you put enough pressure on it, it actually sticks together. So this is not just the usual magnetic field thing. And this is what happens for, for protons. So you can imagine a proton, they hate each other. They don't want to be each other. But if you hit them with enough energy, they start to they fuse together. This is the idea of fusion. So you were the, you've actually built your first fusion reaction. OK, OK, OK. The electrons, for example, on the other hand, do exactly the opposite. You can never, if I switch it around to the green, this is a cute little demo. There's never going to be a chance of two electrons are going to ever touch each other. But protons have this strong force, this weird force, which actually, when they get real close to each other, they suck each other in, and that's it. They just uh, they refuse to let each other go until you put pretty much the, 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 the uh, the energy of a Mack truck behind each particle to actually make it move. So that's our idea of a so-called strong nuclear force. Here's what we call the standard model. This is replacing, in some sense, what used to be called the periodic table. The periodic table of elements was describing chemistry. This is the standard model, which describes the underlying forces, underlying particles of the so-called periodic table. This is the stuff where the periodic table, the hydrogen atom and stuff is made of. It's got a quarks. It's got gluons, leptons, bosons, et cetera, et cetera, all these cute words. And here you see a very interesting feature. The four forces of the universe are described, the strong nuclear force, electromagnetic and weak, and then there's the gravitational theory. Now, gravity is not really part of the standard model. That's because no one has really until recently detected what is called a gravitational wave. So this gives you an idea. Now, the force that you saw Leslie's mom push, it had to be around 10 to the minus 18 meters, so that's 0. .0000 out to 18 before you see this thing actually to suck each other in. That's how that strong nuclear force takes over. If I, were to, if I were to compare the strength of the four forces of the universe with each other and say electromagnetic magnetism is one, the, elect the weak force, the stuff which is in the beta and alpha decay, which causes lava to be hot, make your uh, smoke detectors work, is about one. The strong nuclear force is about 25 times stronger but gravity is one over one, zero, zero, zero. If you were to sit here and count, you'd find 40 zeros here. 
So you say, well, how in the, who in the world ordered gravity? Okay, because gravity is out of the picture right here. However, to show you how, how, uh, how absolutely ridiculously weak gravitation is, if I were to ask, for example, Linda to stand up, all she has to do is fire a few neurons, send a few electrons down her muscles, and she can stand up against the whole planet's gravitational field. It takes no work at all to do this, okay? Because all we do is we, our bodies are using electromagnetic forces, and the, the gravitational forces can barely keep up with that, and a whole planet is trying to keep you down, and it's not enough. So that gives you an idea of how weak this force is. So at this point, you may be wondering, how in the world do you know anything about gravity, okay? It's very fascinating. In fact, uh, uh, we'll talk about how it works, but gravity is pretty much responsible for a lot of the way our world works. Up to, I believe, I can, I can at least, I'm not an astronomer, but I can attest to the fact that up to gold or so, all these elements came from supernova explosions, okay? Which came from the crushing of gravity into, into to just the crushing of gravity into some stars, and the explosion of the nova produce these heavy particles because you allow diffusion to take place. Protons just won't touch each other otherwise until, as you saw with Leslie's mom, you have to slam enough energy into it. Supernova remnants give you the periodic table. So your chemistry, the stuff you're made of, are remnants of stars in some sense. There's the, of course, was if, you, if you enjoyed the Winter Olympics like I do, really getting this, do you think they make a snowboard that'll hold me? That's what I'm, I'm and then of course there's people like myself who have another gravitational issue all together, okay? <laughs> So, but we know how gravity works for, for lots of reasons. Isaac Newton comes along and we think that that's the end of it, right? Well, Isaac Newton says, well, he's hanging out in a tree with his ex-girlfriend or something, and he finds out that, that this apple falls on him. What's remarkable is that, that Newton th sees this apple falling and the moon going around the earth in the same framework. Okay, that's absolutely brilliant. If you think about what he did, okay, in order to produce a universal theory of gravitation, how many of us looked at the moon, saw it in the sky, and, and dropped our keys in the toilet and said, wow, that's the same force, okay? <laughs> well, you probably had other things on your mind if you did that, but uh, you see what I'm saying. But that's what he did, okay? And that, it's the power of that, uh, of that idea. He says, well, everything has to have this one over R squared force. So that powerful one over R squared idea left a lot of holes, and Newton even said, so I have a lot of problems with this theory, but let's see if we make it work anyway. So it's, he gives a second order differential equation called F equals MA, okay? And his problem, one of his problems is, is he can't figure out how do particles know where their R is so they can tell how much attraction or repulsion they're gonna have, the attraction for the one over R. That's called the problem of action at a distance. Also, F equals MA, the, the equation, the differential equation which he, he, he derives or he, he postulates for his forces has to require to be a non-inertial reference frame, okay? where Newton's so inertial reference frame is on, and that means if I'm sitting here doing like this, I can't use Newton's laws to describe the physics which I see, which doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So if I see a, a kid playing basketball, we'll go through in a second, I can't use F equals MA because I have to be an inertial reference frame for it to apply. We'll say so, and secondly, where does this one over R squared law come from? That's a deeper question, it's a richer question, but it's the kind of question that theorists always ask. Okay, so. To give an idea of the so-called idea of action at a distance, we're going to let the, a planet go around the sun. And the first thing you know is this is our, this is our Newton's law, F equals MA, okay, MA equals F, pretty much. And it says the acceleration of a body is proportional to all the force. The only force I'm allowing on that, on that planet was this. But how did it know that the sun hadn't moved around somewhere to get to find the R? And we know from electrodynamics how that works because electricity and magnetism says that a charged particle gives off a one over R squared force too, but the minute it starts to move, it radiates an a, a, a electromagnetic field. So that's how we know. So we need a field theory which can actually propagate like electrodynamics. To demonstrate this idea of a, just a charged particle, just to give you an idea, we have what is called the generic microwave oven. Everybody's got one at home. And all it does, it has a, a cyclotron generator up here which spins a bunch of electrons around a circle. That's all it's doing. And what it blasts away at is an electromagnetic field. So I'm going to turn this on. And all I have is a bunch of LEDs there, no battery operator or anything. And all you see is the excitation of the electromagnetic radiation impinging on these, LED, these little, little bulbs here. There's no power, there's nothing going in here but the pure radiation field. And that's just coming from the motion of accelerating charged particles around the circle and you just blast away. They, they emit this electromagnetic field. So as soon as they settle down and stop moving, 
the field stops and there's no, there's no more radiation field, okay? There's still an electron or two there, but it's not enough to, to cause any, any radiation. That microwave radiation there, it's interesting, and that, 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 that demo is ex it's very interesting because you saw two different things there. There's two forms of quote-unquote light. There's the one which lit up the, uh, the bulbs, okay, which is the radiation field from the microwave. That's about that thick. But the red light which you saw coming out is about a billionth of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a meter, okay, coming out. So your eyes are these detectors. They can see the tiny stuff. The screen has holes in it, right? And it's because the fat guys can't bounce. They see a mirror, so they bounce back into the cavity, and they don't hurt, hurt, hurt you, but the light which is coming out through your eyes can, can sneak right past it. So it's an idea of, it's an interesting idea of the way things resonate and how different frequencies of light do different things. So as far as the microwave is concerned, it can't, it, it, it sees just a solid wall like you're using your cell phone in an elevator. So our solution is to have a field theory like Einstein, like, uh, like that. So, so we want to find out, first of all, this non-inertial reference frame, okay? Let's look at how this, how this works. So I got a guy on a pogo stick. And so we're going to observe this event, this space-time event, from two frames of reference. One where your uh, graduate student is in the merry-go-round, supposed to be working, okay, walk, going like this. This is called a non-inertial observer, but that your, your graduate student definitely sees the pogo stick. So the, the, she can describe, she can write down an equation of motion, whether it's F equals MA or not. And of course, you are on vacation because you've you got tenure, okay? <laughs> and so you're in an inertial reference frame. You're sitting at rest, and you're observing it well. So Einstein's point of view was there has to be a coordinate transformation where they can agree in their notebooks that they saw the same phenomena, okay? And so that's the mathematical transformation, which we call the general coordinate transformations. So general relativity is about saying that there's nobody who's more preferred to another, whether it's inertial or non-inertial, Everybody sees the same thing, and this math should exist. So Maxwell's theory, okay, is, is, is a theory where it is a set of differential equations. Every graduate student, Maxwell's equations are very nice. It's very fascinating for the physicists in the room. We're stunned at the fact that we actually teach it to our undergraduates because it's got to be one of the most complicated things we drop in the, in the lap of somebody. It's a set of differential equations which are partial, at least they're linear, but they, they, tell, they, also, they, they also have some other complicated structure to them, but they tell us what the electric fields look like if you give me the charges. They tell me how the fields should move around. So I can, I can write down an equation that tells me if you spin those charges around like this, how that radiation field should emit. And every one of your uh, cell phone operators and the engineers who build uh, towers, they know exactly how to send out lobes of radiation to different communities. There may be a big farm over this way, which doesn't have cell phone users, but there may be a, a, a people over here who do, they know how to, to align those, those antenna so the radiation field points in certain directions. So that's because they can just do the mathematics and get it done. Now, Einstein also said one other thing, okay? So gravity is, is uh, first of all, it doesn't care what the particle properties are. What this means is the following. Suppose that you take Leslie, who's about a third of my size, and me, and we were sort of push us into a gravitational well off Van Allen Hall or something, okay? As we start to fall, you will notice that she falls at exactly the same rate I do. That means that my attributes, my charge, my mass, my color, didn't matter whatsoever. Gravity didn't care about who I was, so Einstein says, well, maybe this has something to do with the space-time structure itself in its own right. Because the falling didn't seem to care about who was falling. It only cared about the, the rate at which they fall. Seemed to, you seem to lose the properties of, of who, was, who was the person uh, whatever the charge, for example, they have an electric field, for example, if I were positively charged and she was negatively charged, she would actually float away and I would actually fall, fall in. Okay, so that's the way it would be different. But here we don't see that. Einstein also says that, <clears throat> let's go out and buy ourselves a Tesla Model S and put it in ludicrous mode. And all of, everyone knows if, who didn't do physics and went and got an engineering degree, you can actually buy these things, okay? In ludicrous mode, you can actually go about, what about, 5G? Something you can, get to, you can get to 60 miles per hour in two seconds. Einstein said if you were blacking the windows of your Tesla, this was written, in, this was written down in 1915, just kidding. If you blacken the windows 
and you hit that ludicrous mode and you feel yourself pressed against the seat, you couldn't tell the difference between whether it was acceleration or someone just put Jupiter behind your back, okay? You just feel yourself being pulled. So Einstein infers that acceleration and gravitation are also tied in. Again, there's this tie-in with the space-time structure. And he also invokes this idea of the principle of general covariance. Now, he wasn't a real expert on that, but he employed a bunch of mathematicians to help him figure it out. We'll talk about that in a second. So there's two principles he has. The principle of equivalence, which says that two part of the structure of, uh, of, of gravity really doesn't depend on, on the, 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 the object falling. The statement is really only true for test particles because two black holes fall towards each other. They influence each other's gravitational field. But that's a, that's a conversation I'll have with you in my class. I teach general relativity one year, so if you, if you want to stick around. Then the, and the principle of general covariance, which says that nobody has a preferred reference frame. Okay? So Newton was sort of happy that someone actually said that because he now knows how to worry about not inertial or just inertial reference frames. Here's a translation of Einstein's original paper, okay, and, and you can see that he pretty much says that, I like this idea, say which hold good, okay? I think I'm gonna start using words like that in my papers. Okay, these equations have to hold good. But the, and his, his documents which he wrote, this is around anywhere between, if you, if you study general relativity, you realize there's sort of a slur of papers, it's not just one that Einstein wrote. Anywhere from 1915 to 1918, so, so that's 17 or so, you see papers that he's writing. But one really came out in, in 19, 1916, 1917, and it sort of marked the, actually the 100th anniversary of his, uh, of his discoveries, which is actually around the same time we discovered gravitational radiation with LIGO, and I'll talk about that in a second. He also has this idea of special relativity, which is just a special version. But Einstein's idea of the apple falling is much more complicated. It's more like the following. So it's this idea that the curve, is spa the space is curved. So let me show you sort of how this works in This particular diagram, I'll show this in a second, okay? But I'll put this lump of, of, of lead here in this, in this, in this uh, rubber drum, and I'll show that, and I'll show what I'm going to do in a video. So Einstein needs two physicists, two mathematicians to help him. One who's dead, his name is Riemann. Riemann was a, a physicist who uh, uh, worked with, who was a student of Gauss, and Riemann says the following. The geometry is, of two things is very different from each other. And this idea of Euclid, Euclid finally, we were finally unleashed from New Euclid's bound. When we talk about geometry in high school, we're not talking about geometry in modern day world. We're talking about the idea of geometry in flat lines. The idea that a triangle, if you add up the angles of a triangle, it has equal to 180 degrees and all this kind of stuff. The Riemann was like, how can that possibly work on a sphere? For example, in this sphere here, I could have 90 degree angles at each one of the triangles on this surface, and it won't add to 180, but yet I still have a well-defined triangle. The idea of geodesics, the idea of shortest distance between two points is not a straight line. It's this word called geodesic, and that depends on the surface or the curvature, if you will, of an object. So this is a very, this is like a major breakthrough in mathematics that you can actually say, if, you have a, if you're building a bowl, and you want to know how the fluid moves in the bowl, it's going to flow along a direction. Its shortest distance is not a straight line. It can't go through the bowl. If you have a cockroach moving on your basketball, it sees a two-dimensional world, right? It can't, and it's, if it's trying to get from one to the crumbs on the other, it's going to take a, a long, it's going to go along a great circle in order to get to the, in order to get to the other crumb. It's not going to go wandering around, and it cannot form a straight line. So this idea of, it's called Riemannian geometry. When Riemann died at 39, his, his PhD advisor was Gauss, and those of you who know uh, mathematics and physics, Gauss was a big deal. And he was the guy who put a lot of effort into understanding what is called magnetism before he understood electricity and magnetism. So the idea of this of, of, uh, of Riemann is sort of simple in this direction here. So let me just show you this, uh, this little example of what I'm doing. I'm just taking a vector, which means something which is tangent to the surface, and I move it, so it's pointing up, this is my laser, it's pointing up this way. And if I move around this way, and then I come around back to the side, Notice that the vector points in the opposite direction where it was. If I do that on a piece of paper, it always stays exactly in the same direction where it was, okay? This is a way of measuring what is called curvature, and if you look at the, what happens on a plane over here, nothing happens. So Riemann has developed a, a very sophisticated math set of mathematics 
The other, the other major contribution was from uh, a mathematician named Emmy Nerther. And Nerther was a, uh, a German Jew, a woman in Germany, and she was not allowed to go to college, okay? Her dad was a mathematician and her, and her brothers were mathematicians. What's interesting about her is she was, uh, she was a sort of a show off. So she went and said, you guys can do what you want. I'm going to go take the final exam at the university. So she takes it. She smokes the exam. She smokes it. The professors look around, well, how can we not give her a degree? And so, so they finally gave her a degree. And she actually went on to work with a PhD with the guy named Hilbert, who was the major competitor for uh, Einstein, and also the developer of quantum mechanics. Nerda has this very interesting idea. She says that if your equations are such that they say that you can change t goes to t plus Tuesday, so I can go for, in other words, if I can do, if, if your equations say that whatever happens on Monday, you can also just as well have done it on Tuesday, or you could have just as well have done it on Wednesday, which is mostly like all electromagnetic fundamental forces, then this quantity called energy is conserved. If you have what is called, if your physics doesn't change, if you, if you were to displace a particle from here to here, and there's no change, then this idea of momentum is conserved. And similarly for rotations, means there's angular momentum, et cetera. And then there's more complicated structure, which is called the U1, which means electric charge, and there's general coordinate invariance, which Einstein uh, uh, took advantage of to find out what is, called, what is to get his final equations of motion. She died, interestingly, so she, she's sort of my hero. I'm an employee of the state of, the, of, the, of Iowa, and so, what that means is that, you know, you, you want to grumble about your pay and all this kind of stuff all the time. My goodness, they don't pay me enough. I'm so smart. You know, you know, Nerther worked for a year and a half for her life for pay. And she amassed a massive amount of physics and, and mathematics, which we all use. Well, the first thing you learn in quantum field theory is Nerther's theorem. That's the first thing you learn. I didn't know who Nerther was. It's the word you use. But Nerther's theorem, Nerther uh, was uh, left Germany for the same reason Einstein did. She was a German Jew in the 30s. And she went to Bryn Mawr University, and um, they paid her for the first time in her life a real salary as a professor. And she had a hysterectomy. It was in the post-op that she actually died. And so here we have a, someone who's very young, and she, we, we sort of lost, but uh, Einstein at the obituary gave her this, uh, made this remark. Okay, he also made this remark several years later. This is Einstein's equations, okay? They're very beautiful in the sense that they're ugly as hell if you try to work with them. But the way it's written now, it's in a very nice, coherent form. This A can go from 0 to 3. B can go from 0 to 3. So these 10 nonlinear partial differential equations embedded in this thing. And this is what F equals MA looks like. That's the A, acceleration. Notice there's no mass, M, because M didn't matter. And this is the force which is due on a particle. This thing has both electric, gravitational electric versions, a, a gravitational magnetic version, and then there's even more complicated magnetic, magnetic kind of thing floating around in it but it, it's at least a set of equations you can work with. The set of equations goes on like this, and Einstein and Hilbert, who was the PhD advisor of, of Emmy Nerther, pretty, we're, trying to, we're competitors with each other, and so they, we decided to call the so-called action, in physics we have what is called the action S, from which you can derive all the field equations and everything you want. Once you have it, you can get all the, the physics you need. And so we can get Einstein's equations, the energy momentum tensor, et cetera, from it. This conservation law here was due to Nerther, and Nerther says that on this side, this is, this is going to be given to you by geometry, Riemann's geometry, and on the other side, this says that this guy here has to give you the energy momentum, which will be a conserved quantity. So in my little demo here, which is down below, I'm just taking a, a little ball, and I'm showing you the curvature. All I do is I put this ball in a membrane, and you can see that the curvature of the membrane is what's forcing this thing to spin around. And that's the idea of curvature due to, due to uh, Riemann. Now, a lot of stuff was explained by this. First of all, it was long, for, long known for a while that mercury didn't, have a, w didn't satisfy the equation most for just an ellipse, OK? I, if you look at the 1 over r squared force of Newton, no planet should, if a planet is sufficiently far away from other planets, it should always just form an ellipse, it's a conic surface. It can, it can be nothing else. It didn't. And people tried to correct it with the blatantness of the sun and all kinds of things near planet. And it did all the corrections. But yet there was still this so-called, this lobe, this lobe of the eclipse, ellipse just sort of generated the moves. It's called the perihelion shift. It's now known that it's about every, every, every century of Earth, 
that it moves about 43, uh, just almost a, a second, okay, uh, on the clock. Einstein's theory of general relativity explains that very quickly as one of his first calculations he did to show it was a Kelvin circle. Another thing that Einstein's theory did was he showed that light actually bends too, because even though it has no mass, it actually is influenced by the space-time curvature. And so a big uh, expedition was sent into South Africa by Eddington and several other millionaires at the time to see if they could actually pr prove this. And Eddington actually came back with the plates in 1919, which definitively showed that there was a, a bending of light. So when, when the, during, the, during the eclipse of the sun, stars which were supposed to be over there looked like they were coming straight at us, okay, in the plates. And so the light had bent around the sun, and now you could black out the, the sun's uh, bright corona, and you actually could see the bending of light. We see that all the time now. In fact, it's, our way, it's, it's, a, it's an example of, of just a, one of thousands upon thousands of, of, of ways we have now of showing that there's this bending of light taking place between um, a, a dark object moving across the sky with the light bending around it. And you can see an imaging, you see mirror imaging of different species, okay, from one point to another. So here's one, here's C, for example, and B. This blurring here is due to the bending of light. If you were to take your uh, atomic clock up into space and you actually were to compare it to uh, something on the ground, you would find that you actually lose time. So in the, in the 70s, to test Einstein's theory, Einstein said that there's going to be a slowing of clocks in a gravitational field. What that means is a fundamental change in the space-time structure of someone in a gravitational field compared to not. And if they were to commit, compute, from your point of view down on Earth, it looks like the, the people up there above are actually moving slower, or, or their clocks are they're just, things aren't happening as fast. And they would look the other way and they say, it looks like you're moving faster. Turns out there's the difference between these two spacecraft, the spacecraft that took a maser up, 6,200 miles up, and it measured that there was a time dilation of a billionth of a degree from the clocks drifting off because they're in the presence of this field. And you may say, well, Vince, that's just a billionth. You know, that's not a big deal, is it? Well, let's think about it. How fast are your processors now in the computers? They're, they're on the order of gigahertz, right? So in a second, one second time, it can easily produce a, a, about, 10 calculation, about, about 10 billion calculations. That's what you have when, a, when you have gigahertz calculators. Your gigahertz calculators are actually responsible for what is called the GPS system. If the GPS system, these devices are 25,000 miles up, these geosynchronous uh, satellites, so these, as these satellites move around, there's about, what, 40 of them in the, in the GPS system? We have about uh, 14,000 satellites wrapping around the Earth right now. Well, yeah, the, but the ones that describe GPS, they're sitting at around 25,000 miles up around the Earth. And in 15 minutes, you could destroy, destroy the economy of the modern world, okay, if you don't include general relativistic corrections. Because they have to, they have to, they have to give telemetry information back to banks and things like this for all the transactions which take around the world. So general relativity is real now. It used to be just a, a cute little thing, okay, when 10 to minus 9 seconds was not a big deal. But now when we have gigahertz processors t uh, and, and telemetry like so, it's a big problem. And then there's the early universe. Einstein writes his theory between, say, I said 1907 to 1916. He never, I don't think he's ever really solved this problem. His, his, uh, his own, he, he gives us an equation, but I, I don't think there's a single calculation <laughs> I mean, I have to check, but I, I'm an old guy now, but I don't think as a single calculation, he actually gave an explicit exact solution for anything, okay? But the Friedman gave an ex a solution of an expansion and contraction using the metric idea for universe, but he died in 1925. But in 19, uh, 1927, a, a Catholic priest, Monsignor uh, Lemaitre, developed what is called the primeval atom theory, which is now known as the Big Bang Theory. And in this theory, he actually says much more. He says that not only are galaxies receding and, and, their, and it was expanse, he says if I were to play the, the record backward, it actually should have been a primeval atom which everything blew up from, okay? At the, and, and, and it caused a sort of a genesis. In fact, the, the Pope of the Catholic Church wanted to praise Lemaitre for, uh, proof, for proving scientifically that there was the, the genesis. And, and, and Lemaitre said, you, you really have to back off because both science and religion do different things, and there's several ways to understand the world, but let's not try to make one prove the other. So it was a, in the 30s, Lemaitre was, um, was, was considered, people didn't quite like it at first, but then Hubble 
which is famous for the big Hubble telescope, actually measured the, re the recession of the galaxies, which the Metro had, 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 had predicted. You have to understand there's about 100 different cosmology ideas out there of how the universe works. So when you pull a guy out of the, out of the woodwork like Lemaitre, I mean, it came with extreme testing. No one wants anybody else to be right, okay? That's the way, that's the way scientists are. But when you finally settle down, okay, the guy, is, is, uh, he, he, he beat me to it, that's what happened. Einstein was one of these people who didn't quite agree with Lemaitre, but after Hubble in 1933, and that's the one nice thing about my New York Times subscription, you can always pull up old uh, New York Times articles, you see they got to get in a photo shoot with each other because they got the inventor of general relativity here and the guy who's proving it <laughs> right, okay, next to each other, and they're, and they're now buddies. Well, so they became buddies after, the, after Hubble proved that what Lemaitre was saying was right. Other ways which you can study this are through these microwave, microwave probes. So in here you see a horn which the Bell Labs was producing in 1965. This horn was meant to fire microwaves at a big blob of balloon in the sky and use that to bounce over into China or Japan to communicate with each other. That's what it's meant to be. But they couldn't get this noise out of it. There was this hum in the background as these guys were cleaning pigeon droppings and everything out of it. They went up and talked to some Princeton professors. They said, oh, you're measuring the background microwave radiation from uh, the, the Big Bang, okay? So this was, what, this was the, the first evidence. And these guys won the Nobel Prize for, um, for discovering this microwave background radiation from the expansion, from the cooling of the universe as it expands out it leaves behind a three degree Kelvin signal, which is about 2.73 degrees signal, which is microwave. Because what I'm about to show you is sort of interesting about microwave. So I'm gonna let you use the microwave gun. So it's gonna take a second to warm up. Microwaves are very interesting because the microwave, does anybody know why the microwave oven came about? It's, they were building these big horns. You can come over here. And just, you're gonna just hold this and point it towards me, okay? okay? Well, you can point it towards them for a few seconds and show them what it looks like. You see the needle moving up and down? Okay, so the needle's moving up and down. And so now I have what is called a dipole radiator. So she has a dipole radiator, and I have a dipole antenna, and I'm detecting her. But that signal is very specific because if I turn out the alignment of it, it goes away. Now, what these guys are doing with their microwave, uh, with their microwave horn in, um, in, in, um, in, 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 in Bell Labs is they're moving this thing around and, and, it, and you should be able to, to dig out the source so they can't stop the same the sources everywhere. And so that's sort of strange. They're getting a genuine microwave signal, but you can see if I turn away or if I turn the wrong angle, that signal's gone. That means that this thing is coming from somewhere else. So the story I was going to tell you about the microwave oven is that uh, there was these guys had these big horns, okay, for transmitting, and the guy had a chocolate bar, and he stood in front of one, and the chocolate bar melted, okay? And he said, dang, you know, maybe, maybe we can make an oven out of this, and it turns out that that's exactly what he did. <laughs> he put a little popcorn in front of him, and he watched it blow up, and it's <laughs> so that's exactly where the microwave oven came from, was just from these big horns like that being tested for communications. We have a couple of new probes that went out. The United States sent out three. Uh, the, the sent out two, it was called COBE, Cosmic Orbiter, Mike, Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe here. And then the Europeans sent out what is called Planck. And Planck came back recently in 2013, and we found out of some very interesting stuff about our universe using theories similar to Lemaitre, it's actually Lemaitre's theory we call cold dark. Our universe, our visible universe is about 18.14 billion years old. Um, is a, a flood of invisible particles called neutrino, which are just flooding through us all the time. And we don't even know about it because they don't interact very well with us, but they're flooding through us. And the first stars it ignited about two million years after the Big Bang, okay? The universe is expanding at, at about a Hubble uh, parameter, about 71 kilometers per second per microparsec, me megaparsec. And so far it looks like that our universe will expand forever if, according to the theory. When I get to uh, the end, I'll talk, which is just a few seconds from now, I'll talk more about this thing here, which is us, and the rest of this is the unknown universe. So this is the stuff which our world is now working on. This is why gravity is still a big problem. What are we actually living in? So we don't know where we are, because we're only about 4 to 5% of the known universe gravitating bodies. Okay. 
The other thing that this thing does is produces what is called gravitational waves. And this is where we'll, 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 we'll show. So in some sense, using um, telescopes and things like that to see stuff, for example, in this picture here, we see about a 25 year study to watch the two collapse of two stars. Now, according to Einstein's theory of, of general relativity, it should be radiating off, just like you see the microwaves there, radiating off gravitational radiation, and they should be losing their orbit, just like you saw our ball spin into the, into, the, into the surface. And so after 25 years, and this guy, Halsey, had a graduate student from the University of Iowa, I believe, who did most of the work. So this, you see this loss of, 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 of path, and general relativity prediction nailed it precisely. So this is one, it's one of the more precise calculations in general relativity, and probably uh, in field theory in general. In 2017, the Nobel Prize was winning for not something indirect where you just see something collapsing and you predict, well, it must be the loss of due to radiation, but, but for the actual discovery of gravitational waves. I'll try to tell you about how that works right now. As you just saw, when we did the microwave, the microwave has a dipole transmitter, transmitter like this. It just it bounces up and down. What we see for general relativity is that you have something which moves and squashes like this. And th that method of moving and squashing is measured with what, what is called a laser interferometer. I have one here. I broke it bringing it to you, but I think the picture here does it. So this is a, this thing, this black device here is a laser interferometer, and you get a fringe effect, and you can measure about a distance just in the room here with the laser interferometer. You can measure from the gaps in these little spacings here uh, a quarter of the wavelength of green light. And the green light's about 500 nanometers, which is a five, about a half a billionth, a half, a, half a billionth of a, uh, of a meter. So you can get down pretty low to make a measurement of, a, of the distances of something between them with these, with these laser interferometers. They're extremely precise. What these gravitational waves are doing is that you slam solar masses of stuff each into each other. And here I'm going to show three solar masses worth of stuff being produced, of, of, uh, of radiation being produced. But by the time it gets to Earth, it's, billions, it's several billion years old, about a billion years old, it's actually produced a, it has a, um, it has about a picometer of, uh, of displacement it can make on things. So you have to have extreme measurements. And not only that, you have to, have, you have to do it twice. So you can actually say you've actually solved it. And this is what we've done with the LIGO as well as Virgo antennas. The laser interferometer uses a device like that. You send a light in. And if there's a, if there's a, a fringe effect, you need, you'll, see, uh, you'll see that if, there's, if it's a coincidence, and the coincidence agrees with another device 3,000 uh, kilometers away, then you know it was a gravitational wave. So here's an example of how LIGO works, and I'm going to show you a picture of LIGO. But the LIGO is a device which is this massive antenna. Now instead of the dipole antenna which I have here, I need one which is about four kilometers that way, and about four kilometers that way. It can form a crisscross like that, and I need to put lasers down these tunnels of these things, and the laser is going to be, they can actually measure the displacement when the gravitational wave comes in, it'll actually fluctuate that light wave in such a way that it actually is in coincidence with another device, and that way you'll know that this was indeed a, uh, a gravitational wave. So we've got two of them in the United States. We have a detector in Hanford, and we have one in Livingston down below, and about 3,000 kilometers away. So the radiation field is going to, coming in, slap the Earth, it's going to slap this antenna, and it's going to slap that antenna, and it's about, what, 10 microseconds of, uh, of distance between each other with the speed of light? So we can actually measure it and actually know. And indeed, we find that actually the signal, this is a testing of the strain of the noise. This is a very sophisticated piece of engineering. And even if you know people who don't want to be physicists, just to build these machines and to do the electronics, engineering, the technology, just to maintain it, there's a whole industry of stuff out there for people to get involved in anytime they want. Here's the Virgo antenna, which is in, in Europe. And it's about uh, three kilometers in this direction. So in 2017, which is less than a year ago, we, we had the first definitive proof that 250 solar masses binary stars ran, ran into each other, two black holes. They're black because there was no charge remnant. There was no electromagnetic field which followed. In that time, you saw what, about a 29, uh, a, a, a object about 29 times heavier as our own sun, okay? And about 36, they slam into each other. 
They produce a single object with 62 uh, solar masses, but they leave behind about three solar masses of gravitational radiation floating around the universe. And this took, about, took a long time to get to us because this happened a long time ago. Here were the coincidence signals. So here is the one in Hanford. Here was the one, and if you lay the Hanford data on top of the one on Washington and you shift for the 10 microsecond deviation because of the speed of light, you find that the strain count, this, this is the fingerprint. This is probably a very sophisticated fingerprint. And the way this works is that you do a numerical relativity calculation and you have what are called competitions with uh, different groups. And they see who's, who can actually predict what they're about to see. And there's a whole template then of what each signal means, okay? And so this signal here means what I just described, these solar mass objects running into each other. This is exactly how your cell phone also knows that you, you took so many steps, right? It's a accelerometer, it's a, it's a three axle accelerometer in your pocket. As you walk around, it's, it, you can't just do this and fake a step, right? You had to give off a particular pattern or signature before you can actually say you took a step. Of course, that's nothing compared to this, but you see where I'm getting at. Again, we also saw two neutron stars run into each other. And that was just, just, not just, just right afterwards. And here was a whole cascade of events. It was a very beautiful piece of physics because there were about 70 different observatories which measured first the gravitational radiation, then there was a gamma ray burst which is measured, then there was, a, there was an optical measurement, there was, and then there was some radio signals measured, and it all correspond to the absorption and re-emission. So for example, this happened very quickly. This took two seconds later, 10.5, about 11 hours later, et cetera, and it's all consistent. And here we see those are the kind of things which produce stuff like gold on our periodic table. Those are the kind of collisions which produce gold. It's not a clever way to try to go make gold, by the way. Don't, uh, don't try to sl slam two neutron stars into each other. So one of, our one of our undergraduates at the University of Iowa actually was part of this observation. So if you don't mind if I play like a, a three minute movie or four minute movie. And so Maria Drought was one of our undergraduates and she's, she was a, she's a postdoc at Harvard now. So Lisa is an interesting device. So what Lisa will do is this is gonna be deployed in 2034 or so. Lisa is a, is a laser interferometer which will pretty much have a set of lasers, almost the size of just little Volt Volkswagen bus beetles, floating around each other, but they're sitting about five million kilometers away from each other. Remember, the, the sun is only about 1.3 million kilometers in dis displacement. This is going to form a massive triangle right behind Earth, float behind Earth, with a big five, five million kilometer triangle floating around behind Earth listening and set up to form an interferometer and waiting for gravitational waves now. In, in cold, dark space, there are no trucks or anything like that to make noises and all kinds of necessary stuff. Once these the things are set up, and they're set up near a Lagrange point, which means uh, it's a stable point in the gravitational field floating around this, uh, this planet, our planet, it can actually detect gravitational waves of longer frequencies, okay, longer wavelengths, shorter frequencies, but uh, it's a, an interesting device which is being deployed. I have a little movie here. So this, this, this antenna called LISA, Laser Interferometer Space Antenna, will be deployed around 2030. And it'll be listening to any gravitational phenomena. For example, it's called space weather, and you'll actually give it a way to actually detect even other devices, other stuff which is coming in uh, to the solar system, not just gravitational waves. Okay. What's nice about these, the gravitational wave is it penetrates what is called the, the surface of last scattering. So you ever look up in the night sky and you see, oh, that's so beautiful, you see all these stars. But go out there right now and try to look up in the night sky. What do you see? You see blue, right? That's because you have so much scattering from the, from the, the nitrogen is being dissociated by the photons coming in from the sun. There's so much nitrogen, that be, so it forms what is called a surface of scattering. Okay, so the surface of last scattering is what you call the blue sky. As soon as the sun gets on the back of us and gets out of our way, the amount of photons which are impinging on the Earth's atmosphere goes away, and all of a sudden you can see out into the open sky, and you can see billions of miles away now. Okay, so it turns out there's a surface of last scattering even for the early universe. And it calls, it calls it, called the cosmic microwave background was that last scattering. The microwave probes that I showed you from WMAP, et cetera, did that. 
But a gravitational wave can come right through this. And so our gravitational wave detectors will go right through this as well. And so they can actually see up to early universe, i.e. beginning of the term time of inflation, as opposed to stopping here. Right now our best estimates are about, uh, that's why we say 13.8 uh, billion years old for the universe. Our big question, like I said before, is what's making up the other 4.5% of the gravity, what's the other making up the other 95% of the gravitating matter? Part of my research is to explain where that comes from, okay? Um, that's another talk. And, the, um, and, and lots of other people are, wor are trying to understand, is it just stuff that we just can't see, it wasn't luminous, et cetera, or, or, or is it just a matter of our instruments not being sophisticated enough, or is it something genuinely out there? And so here's my last slide. So here's the way you can think about what might be happening. Here's who we are, our periodic table right here, stuff made of this. But there could be genuinely different periodic sets of chemistries out there which don't communicate with each other just like the microwaves can't see outside the room here because it's, it's just opaque to us. But gravity is the, the single medium which communicates with everybody. And so all that slew of other stuff which is happening, as we get better understanding of gravitation, we can start communicating with these other sectors as well. This is a possibility that what we're talking about, what we call cold, dark matter, all this other stuff, could be whole chemistry sets worth of fun stuff to play with, okay? All right, so I'd like to thank Linda, Linda for the provost, Linda for, uh, for inviting me to come. And I want to thank the, for those of you who are interested in seeing outreach, there's, there's the, her office has Art Share, um, the Grant Wood Colony, as well as uh, Resource Conservation Development Partnership, et cetera. And I'd like to thank Dale Stilley for giving me these, my little toolbox here to play with, and, and I had to get back to him with my broken laser. <laughs> so pray for me. Okay. <laughs> Okay, that's it. So, any questions? Okay. Yes, sir. Can you say something about graviton. How does it fit into this wave? The graviton. The graviton would be um, at the elementary particle level. Okay, so the graviton would be the emission of a of a photon, like obviously. So, the radiation field you see here is considered a wave. It just has to do with the fact that we're being macroscopic versus microscopic. The graviton would be just a, 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 an instant pulse of gravitational energy which is emitted, okay, which is not to be thought of as a wave. I wouldn't classically be able to determine it. So the graviton is, um, is a theoretical uh, construct in string theory, but we know what it would take in order for that to happen. You'd have to be slamming um, solar mass with the energy into elementary particles in order to actually see a graviton because that number is so low. It's one over one. It's compatible with the, the quantum theory of that wave theory. The quantum theory means you just get pulses of light. Like the light you see here is the, is that light there is coming from an atomic spectrum. It produces a, it looks like a wave, but it's really a photon bath which is falling into your eyes right now. So it's compatible, it's just, uh, it's not detectable. That's what the problem is. It's just so weakly detectable. It, it, can't, it can't be detected with, in 2018. 19, 20, 21, I can't see how it's. So the, let's just stick with the big waves first. <laughs> yep. Any other questions? Yes. When that research is deployed, how do those um, satellites maintain their location? It's almost like they're orbiting. How do they maintain their location? There's a, there's a nice Lisa movie. I mean, I actually, it, it, where Lisa shows, it has a cartoon where they show you the deployment of these devices. So the three uh, rockets, go, the rocket goes up, it releases all three of these cylinders. And then they start to, one fires up a laser after it gets to this Lagrange point or stable point, and, it, and the other one just looks for it, okay? And then it starts firing these retro rockets, little, jet, little, little tiny rockets, until the light actually sh shines on its mirrors. And then she fires her, her, her laser back, okay? And then the other one comes on and does the same thing. And then they lock on and phase with each other. Now the electronics inside uh, each one of those, it's just like this table here of, um, This is a trivial idea of a microcin, microcin. Here I'm firing a laser down this way, and I have this family of mirrors when I'm beam splitting in order to produce these fringe effects. This thing must have 15 or 20 of those devices built into each one of them. Part of it just to keep track of where the other one's located. Okay. So there's an interesting little cartoon which didn't use a lot of words. I just don't like that about it. But it showed this cute uh, way in which it used the electronics from the, the laser light itself to keep its, uh, keep its track. 
as well as to decide when it's going to look for a signal. And they were surprised, by the way. They, they just re recently, uh, they just recently stopped the the first Lisa experiment. Lisa's going to be going to the next stage, and they were stunned at how how successful they were to get this. So this inside that, that, that box is a floating it, is a floating double mass system, and it floats in free space. And it's the stability that floating free in free space is part of what the what makes it work. Okay, so so the box can move around, but the thing sits there and floats in the inside in the interior. Yes. Hadron Collider is a, is, a, is, a, is a device which is in Switzerland and France, and it's about 18 kilometers around. It's probably the world's largest microscope ever. It's probably the most sophisticated microscope. And by slamming protons and protons into each other, you can actually can probe the interior of protons and see inside what they're made out of. You can also slam lead into it as well. Lead as well. So what is a quark? A quark is part of the constituents of the, of the proton. So the proton is made of three quarks. So the quarks are considered to be fundamentally uh, elementary. And so those three quarks are held together by gluons. And these gluons are the electromagnetic forces, but there's eight of them. There's only one electromagnetic field. There's eight of these things, and they don't like it. They, they fight with each other all the time. Interesting thing about the gluon is that it travels at the speed of light, too. But it, the, as soon as it starts to move, it creates more gluons. So it never goes anywhere because it's so busy coupling to itself. So it's, it's, a, fu it's a funny... Uh, half the stuff you're made of is gluons, not quarks. Next question. Uh, anyway, so a little question. So a repeating decimal, like the number, like pi, for example, pi, is that an even or odd number? It's not a number. It's not an, it's not an even or odd number if it's not an integer. It's to a number. It's not an integer. Oh, it's not, oh, it's not, okay. Uh, it's just not a number. Yes, it is. It's a number, but it's not an integer. So I can't, so I can't it's a trick question. So it's a, yeah, it's a trick question, yeah. Uh, I have no idea. Yes? So with um, the gravity waves, so it, it looked like the frequency of the gravity waves was like a, was like a 10, 10 in a second or 100 in a second? Yeah, it's pretty slow. It's pretty slow? Because look how many miles. So if, if the, if the, it still travels at the speed of light. So if the frequency times the wavelength is the speed of light. So you, you, you have, uh, what, it took 3,000 kilometers just to have two coincident detectors, each with three kilometer long antenna. So you can, re you can use that formula to work backwards to see how slow the, uh, the frequency is. Because you have massive objects falling into each other. That's huge, actually, for spinning bodies to be moving around each other 100 times a second, okay, as they spin into each other. So. You can only detect what your detector is designed to detect. It doesn't mean you're not, it's th stuff is just slewing through us, but you can only detect what your detector is designed. You can't use these to detect microwave. Something else. Something else. So a different frequency span. But uh, ideally, that's like to have a radio tuner, right? You could actually change the, the frequency with capacitors, okay? And inductance coils, you could rechange, but you don't have, we don't have that kind of world yet. That would be like changing Lisa's uh, five, I mean, just to set it up so they start talking to each other at five million kilometers away from each other took a, quite a piece of engineering feat. Now, let's, but let's, I just don't have a knob I can turn. Let's, let's make it about, uh, you know, you just don't have anything like that. Doesn't mean you can't invent it, just that we don't have it today, so. Hey, thank you uh, okay. so much for coming today, and thank you so much. You're um, welcome. Dr. Rogers, and um, please go to our website to learn more about upcoming presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Linda.